Alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. Praise God, and I bear witness that there is no other God but the one God. Can you guys hear me okay? Is there an echo? Is this better? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we don't have any announcements. I'm just going to jump right into it, inshallah. My topic today is going to be about socialism and its benefits. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding, actually. Uh, Today I want to talk about uh, two experiences that I, uh, that I went through uh, within the last two years and I, I believe that by God's grace they definitely helped to shape um, my mentality to become a little stronger. <clears throat> and that's the, the title of the sermons, uh, A Submitter's Mentality. Uh, I'll discuss some of the things I went through and how it affected me uh, and my mentality and what I had to change and hopefully in the process uh, you guys will you know, learn from my mistakes, and if you're going so, through something similar, maybe you'll, you'll implement what I did. So, we were playing soccer two years ago, and uh, I injured myself pretty badly. Uh, I vividly remember the moment that it happened. Uh, I ambitiously jumped up for a header, and uh, that wasn't the problem. Going up was not the problem. Coming back down was. And I, ran, I landed really awkwardly. I, I basically came down an angle came down at an angle, and I landed on my right leg first. And um, my leg was just not ready to support me, um, and my knee bent in a way that it shouldn't have, and uh, I heard a noise I shouldn't have heard, and I felt a pain I sh wish I didn't feel. Uh, and I, you know, I immediately thought to myself, like, man, this is terrible. Like, that feeling you have when, you, when something pretty terrible happens to you, and you're like, man, what did I do to make me susceptible? for this kind of consequence. The pain got worse uh, with time and you know, by the time I got home and you know, uh, like time went on, I literally couldn't even bend it, a lot of swelling, I couldn't put any uh, weight on it. And uh, so I, I put soccer on hold for you know, a few weeks or so. And this was actually around the same time that the California fires were happening. So uh, the air quality index was pretty terrible. It was like really toxic to be outdoors and uh, there was like every external force was like telling me to stop playing soccer and reflect. And uh, I'm telling you, every single day, countless times a day, I was praying. Praying to God to heal me, to, you know, get me through this consequence. Because I've never really felt like this sort of, uh, you know, this bad of a consequence uh, as far as I can remember. And it was pretty bad. I mean, when I would walk, it was like a constant reminder. Like I would do anything. I would just sit there and it would be in pain. It was just like a constant reminder to me of how royally I messed up. And uh, it, was, it was a really, uh, it was like a cloud that was just constantly hovering over me. And uh, so like I said, a few weeks goes by and it starts feeling a tiny, tiny bit better. I'm able to walk without a limp uh, and able to bend it uh, only partially. So, um, you know, I don't think much of it. I, I still try and just pray and, and, and for God to heal me. And about two months now at this point goes by. And that's actually around the same time where the, the air quality index was like slightly less than toxic. So everyone was looking for an excuse to go outside and, and do something outdoors. So, and at the same time, my knee started to feel a little better. I could jog on it with pain, but I felt like, okay, this is manageable. I can probably play through the pain. So uh, we, that, that upcoming soccer game, um, we had a big turnout, mashallah. Uh, I was so excited to you know, be able to play again and just see everyone again and just play with everyone. And um, I kid you not, I'm not exaggerating, like two minutes into the game, I ended up re-injuring the same knee. And I didn't even touch the ball. I, like, I wasn't even near anybody, I just like stepped. And uh, it was such a depressing feeling. It was such a sad feeling because again, the whole recovery process of me having to like, Wait to heal, the knee was super swollen, couldn't bend it, it was super stiff. And I did this like three or four times. Like embarrassingly, I admit that I, this, this process happened three or four times. And at some point, my mental gymnastics game was so strong that uh, I, f I thought that if I go to the gym and strengthen my lower body, that you know, because soccer is a pretty intense sport. So if I go to the gym and intense my lower, or uh, 
strengthen my lower body that I'm going to be able to withstand some of the pressures that I'm putting on my joints. And, uh, and you can see, like obviously this is legit mental gymnastics. You, you, as a submitter, this type of mentality you should not have because um, this is more of like you're addressing a side effect of the problem rather than addressing the root cause. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I even tried it out. Obviously, same thing happened. Uh, this was like the third time and I was like, I've just kind of started, you know, getting a little upset with myself because uh, it was taking me quite a while to, to address this problem and, and get it fixed. And as believers, if we're experiencing a problem for an extended period of time, um, chances are you're probably persisting in a sin, uh, like in chapter 3, 135 says, and that's not, that's not a quality of a believer. You should, a quality of a believer is that you don't persist in a sin knowingly. And uh, yeah, so around March of this year, I thought to myself, well, Again, embarrassingly admit, well, you know, I, I tried praying to God, it didn't heal, so this must be a sign that I, I should go see a doctor or I should get an MRI and inquire about a surgery or something. So naturally I reached out to Amir and I, I was like, dude, I need to go see your guy and uh, I need to get an MRI and I, I need to just see what, what all is wrong with my knee. Now, um, while I'm dealing with all this knee drama, uh, the guys back then were planning this Yosemite trip, and uh, I was, I was uh, a little hesitant to commit, as you can imagine, uh, because it was a pretty, it even sounded strenuous. Like, n having been on the trip was insane, but like even before, when we were just in the planning process, I was like, this sounds pretty intense. Like, this is probably something I, I don't know, I should probably train for. Um, because we started in Yosemite Valley and went all the way to Half Dome, like the top of Half Dome. And I didn't want to say no because it sounded so much fun. But I also didn't want to commit because I was so uncertain about my knee. And uh, so one night I'm talking to Eileen and I had a really long and constructi a constructive conversation, mashallah, where uh, we were like literally dissecting everything that I was doing wrong. And uh, it might have been a little sour to hear in the moment from Eileen, but uh, it was definitely like worth it. I'm so thankful to God uh, that, you know, that uh, you, I have that person in my life that is able to put me in check, for lack of a better term. Um, and some people believe that your consequences are related uh, to your sin. Some don't. I kind of sit somewhere in the middle where it could or it couldn't. It doesn't have to relate, but... The system is that no matter what your consequence, no matter what, God has designed the system in a way where your consequence will help you deduce what you did wrong. And that's exactly what happened. It was like, it was as clear as day. Once I had this conversation with Eileen, I was like, oh my goodness, like, this is what I've been doing wrong. And honestly, I, <laughs> the, the, I embarrassingly admit that I was just being arrogant. I mean, not to say like just arrogant, but I was being arrogant, like it's a, it's a huge deal. And uh, you know, every now and then when you make a, when you shoot a nice goal or you know, you give a nice pass, you get a few shout outs and compliments and that kind of gets to your head and if you're not careful, that, that sort of stuff will like really make you proud and egotistical and that's, that's what happened and we all know what happens when you know, you're proud of something, you end up losing it. And that's what happened to me. Uh, with, with this consequence, um, I was arrogant uh, in, in the way that I was thinking, at least inwardly. I, I don't know if maybe some of my team may owe me saying I was pretty outward about it too. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's exactly what happened. Uh, I couldn't sprint on it. I couldn't, um, you know, lateral movements. I, literally any joy I had playing soccer was just kind of like it was gone because I couldn't enjoy the sport that I wanted, the way that I wanted to. So I made a very conscious and real effort to change this about myself, not only just in, in soccer, but in general. And um, I wanted to tell you, like talk today, I mean, it was a little long-winded, but I wanted to talk about like arrogance. And, and from reading the verses in the Quran about people that are arrogant in the Quran, it seems like a very, very toxic, toxic thing. It's, it's riddled in the hearts of the enemies of God. And there's many examples of this. Um, in two, chapter 2, verse 247, when Saul was appointed the ruler of Israelites, I'll read the verse. 
The prophet said to them, God has appointed Talut Saul to be your king. I was blamished. They said, how can he have kingship over us when we, have, when we are more worthy of kingship than he? He is not even rich. So, uh, like, take a step back. Actually, I want to talk about uh, what the Bible said that says about this story, too. In, in the first Samuel chapter 9 and 10, I'm not going to read all the 50 verses, but, uh, you know, in the Bible, Saul and his dad are painted out to be, like, very modest people. They live within their means, and... Um, and here, like, you can see that people are calling him, like, not even rich. And we see that, like, people, when they have this sort of, um, when they have this sort of mentality, and, and the subtitle infers, or says this too, that they are questioning God's wisdom when, when this sort of thing happens. Because they have this sort of, like, sense of entitlement, and they feel like they are entitled to something. And so they object, and in the process, they question God's wisdom. Another example is Pharaoh, and this is a pretty prime example. He was wildly arrogant. In fact, in 4035, he, God straight up calls him an arrogant tyrant. Now, I'm not going to cover everything, but here's some of the, you know, the bullet points of what happened. God sent a prophet directly to Pharaoh. He, he like catered and he, he curated these miracles that Moses was performing for Pharaoh. And what did Pharaoh do? He said, I'm going to go hire some magicians. I'm going to be combative and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove you wrong. He made statements like in chapter 2838. Oh, you elders, I have not known of any God for you other than me. Therefore, fire the adobe, O Haman, in order to build a tower that I may take a look at the God of Moses. I am sure that he is a liar. And then what happened when, when the, the magicians finally realized that, hey, like Moses is actually God sent. Like he is a genuine God, a man of God. They wanted to believe and disown, you know, Pharaoh and Pharaoh threatened to kill them. Like, how arrogant and egotistical do you have to be in this position to not, only, um, to not only not be able to withstand someone's uh, criticism, but when they, when they change their mind, they, when they change their mind, you absolutely like, get so mad at them that you threaten to kill them. Um, and in the end, we actually, we, he, Pharaoh was humiliated and dragged into the center of the sea and uh, you know, he was drowned, completely defenseless. He was drowned. In 2839, it says, He and his troops continued to commit arrogance on earth and without any right, and thought that they would not be returned to us. Now, for a while, I thought, like, okay, well, I didn't think. I'm much, much earlier in my years of submission, I thought, okay, well, it says, without any right. So at some point, someone may have a right to be arrogant. Wrong. Um, this is just saying that Pharaoh was so powerful. Pharaoh was so wealthy. Pharaoh had everything. And he still didn't have the right. So what this is saying that you do not have the right ever to be arrogant, to display this sort of arrogance. 3871 through 77 talks about the arrogance of Satan. Your Lord said to the angels, I'm creating a human being from clay. Once I design him and blow into him from my spirit, you shall fall prostrate before him. The angels fell prostrate, all of them except Satan, who refused and was too arrogant, unappreciative. He said, oh, Satan, what prevented you from prostrating before what I created with my hands? Are you too arrogant? Have you rebelled? He said, I am better than he. You, you created me from fire and created him from clay. So what do these stories or you know, these events all have in common? Everyone saw some, like, had some sort of uh, self-entitlement. And to what? These things that people feel self-entitled to are actually blessings that God gives us in the first place. If you take these for granted, if you become unappreciative of them, you will lose them. And uh, I experienced it, unfortunately, but I learned from it, mashallah. And from these stories, you can see that if God blesses you with something and you completely abuse it and, and you, don't, um, you, know, you don't appreciate it for what it is, and you actually become entitled, you become egotistic and proud of it, then you will lose it. Uh, and this sort of behavior causes deviation. Um, but arrogance is, is, is one weakness. It's a really big and like beast-like weakness. But from a general lens, that's the idea with a lot of weaknesses mentioned in the Quran. If you don't address them, they will grow into different parts of your life. They will manifest in different parts of your life. And uh, if they are unaddressed, most likely they will lead you astray. 
And that's the thing. Um, if, if we want to please God, if we want to uh, be redeemed, these kind of things are hard in the moment, but they'll, they'll be joyous one day for us to have overcome. Um, so I'll stop here for my first sermon. Tubo la lo, let's repent. Alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. Praise God, and I bear witness that there is no other, no other God beside the one God. Uh, so just an update on my knee. Uh, <laughs> uh, by the grace of God, I have no pain now. Um, God healed me fully, mashallah. And I didn't see a doctor. I didn't, uh, not that it's you know, uh, forbidden for you to go see the doctor, but uh, that's just the path I decided not to follow, and mashallah, God healed me fully, and I have no pain, um, and yeah, we have a game today at five, so if you can make it, <laughs> uh, so from, from reading the Quran, uh, all jokes aside, yeah, God healed my knee, and this sort of like thing isn't like an outlier, I'm like, I'm not an outlier. If you have a problem and you address the root of the issue and you're like not egotistic about it, God will heal you. Um, God gives you all the tools to fix any situation that you're in and God will help you to climb out of whatever hole you've dug for yourself. And from reading the Quran, we, we actually repeatedly see the statement, believers will have no fear nor will they grieve. So I'll try and articulate this as, as best I can. So fear and grief are two emotions that are kind of complex and basic at the same time. Fear is something that very easily creeps into your mind, and it, it, it doesn't have to be rational at all. Ashkan gave a really good sermon on fear. And uh, for example, you can see a spider, and even though you're a hundred times bigger than it, you'll still like scream or something. You know, it's, it's like completely irrational. All you have to do is like smack it with a sandal and done. But, Sometimes, like, you know, your knee-jerk reaction is to scream and be fearful. And um, it's a very strong emotion, and, and if we're not careful, it can definitely, like, physically control us. Grieving is also a very strong emotion, but it's more reactionary. It happens after the fact. And um, it's interesting that God uses these two emotions together, and I'll, I'll try and articulate this as best I can, why I think that is. Fear always happens before something, and grieving always happens after something. So from what I understand is believers will understand God's system so well that they're not affected by any, like any emotion that's on the spectrum, any negative emotion that's on the spectrum. They will understand God's system so well that they're not affected by any of these negative emotions, whether it's before something happens or after something happens. Now let's take... Um, Let's take a look at the times where God says this statement about believers. Because uh, ultimately what we want to do is we want to be like these people that God mentions in these verses. 569. Surely those who believe, those who are Jewish, the converts, and the Christians, any of them who believe in God, believe in the last day, and lead a righteous life, will have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. 648. We do not send the messengers except as deliverers of good news as well as warners. Those who believe and reform have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. So a couple qualities that we can derive from these verses is that not only do you have to believe, obviously, but you have to be able to reform, which is like your willingness to change and improve. And uh, these, these sort of qualities are very, very important in a believer. 238, we said, go down there from all of you. When guidance comes to you from me, those who follow my guidance will have no, no fear, nor will they grieve. 735, O children of Adam, when the messengers come to you from among you and recite my revelations to you, those who take heed and lead a righteous life will have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. So another commonality in these verses is that whenever some sort of guidance, some sort of commandments come from God, uh, our first reaction should be that we hear and we obey and nothing else. 2 to 260. 2 to 62. Those who spend their money in the cause of God then do 
do not follow their charity with insult or harm, will receive their recompense from their Lord. They have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. 2274, those who give to charity night and day, secretly and publicly, receive their recompense from their Lord. They have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. Again, uh, another thing to common between these two verses is that people spend in the cause of God without withholding. Like they, they are not stingy, they, give in the, they spend in the cause of God because they understand that the investment, the time, the energy, the effort that they put in worshiping God will be repaid to them. The return on, on that investment is, is better than anything you, you'll get in this world. 2.1.12 Indeed, those who submit themselves absolutely to God alone while leading a righteous life will receive their recompense from their Lord. They have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. So, I read a bunch of verses, and one of the qualities that I see that every one of these believers in these verses has is that they value God the way that He should be valued. They follow His guidance. They spend in the cause of God without withholding, without being stingy. They want to change for God. They understand that the opportunity that we have here in this life is so important. They don't squander it. They take full advantage of it. And uh, on this backpacking trip we went on, for me, I found that there was two recurring things that I, that I would do. And it, would, it didn't really fall in line with the verses that I just read. It, it, the believers that are in these verses didn't display these, these sort of qualities, which was that I had fear and I planned for the worst case scenario sometimes. Now, uh, a little bit of primer information. In this group text that we were planning for this trip, people were discussing all sorts of things like the hike and, uh, you know, just information about the hikes and, and the routes that we're going to be taking and their difficulties. And now I'm starting to get in my own head about this, this trip. Even though, you know, uh, my knee, Michelle, is fully healed at this point and I, I really have no reason to, to have any weird thought. I, I start getting in my own head like, oh man, what if my knee gets irritated? What if I can't complete it? What, it's, what if it's too vigorous for me? Um, and then another thing, uh, so that was like me kind of planning for disaster. And the other thing was, I don't really do well with heights. Um, I, I had slash sort of have a fear of heights. And uh, well, in this hike, you gain somewhere around 4,000 feet of elevation, and you're on the side of a mountain. Uh, so this was like, kind of like, you know, an interesting experience for me, because I, I did not want to do this at all, but I figured I'm going to try and conquer this, uh, this, this weakness, this fear that I have. So again, yeah, to give you some perspective, uh, the whole thing from like the Yosemite Valley to Half Dome is about eight miles or so, right, I mean? From Yosemite Valley, to, you're not listening? From Yosemite, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yosemite Valley to Half Dome, I think it's about eight or nine miles or something yeah, along this line, seven miles, okay. 4,000 feet of elevation, the very last couple hundred feet are, uh, are cables on the side of Half Dome. And uh, they're like 45 degrees or more uh, in terms of like the incline and you literally have like nothing like there, you just basically hang on with your hands and you're pulling yourself up with these cables to go on to half dome and there's nothing else that you're uh, you know hanging on to other than that and again you're on the side of a mountain like I'm just like reliving it now honestly and it's uh, it's <laughs> it's a little tough but because uh, you're so high you know there's just nothing <laughs> uh, yeah, and to give you guys some perspective, Ali, Ali of Afarzan, um, we came and we removed these, uh, these cloths from the ceiling for an inspection that we had coming up, and uh, there was a scaffolding, which was like maybe this high, and uh, I couldn't bring myself to get up on it. I, you know, I was very uncomfortable, so the fact that, you know, now I hope, <laughs> I hope you guys understand that this was kind of a big deal. Um, so this is a very popular verse that, that gets referenced a lot, and honestly, rightfully so. 22.15, if anyone thinks that God cannot support him in this life and in the hereafter, let him turn completely to his creator in heaven and sever his dependence on anyone else. He will then see that this plan eliminates anything that bothers him. So that's what I did. I, I, I wholeheartedly put my trust in God at this point in the, in, you know, in the story, and I, I, I just... I, I wanted to go on this trip. I, I, wasn't, I didn't care about anything else. So fast forward a few months, and I'm skipping over some details, but um, 
on the trip, again, like I said, I was, I was reminded by Mashallah Hossein and a few others that uh, I didn't want to like pack my backpack with a bunch of stuff because again, I was like, I wanted to be very careful not to irritate my knee. I wanted to be, even though there was nothing wrong with my knee at this point, I just wanted to be like extra cautious. And thank God, like, you know, I got those reminders and uh, I realized that submitters don't have this type of mentality where, where you plan for disaster. You, you aren't supposed to plan for disaster, you're supposed to be hopeful. You're supposed to be hopeful that God will support you and help you through any situation. Um, and, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, by God's grace, like, we got through the trip. I, I, my feet started hurting from walking so much before my knee. Um, you know, the, the cables, mashallah, we went up. It was kind of tough, I'm not going to lie, but going back down was a breeze. I even turned around and started looking at my scenery, mashallah. It was, uh, it was very enjoyable. And, and again, in this trip, I learned a lot of valuable lessons. I'll try and sum it up here, God willing. I learned that, um, I, I, yet again, I learned that I'm supposed to put my trust in God wholeheartedly, with zero hesitation. Because by planning for the worst case scenario, or by having fear, you're essentially not trusting in God. You are giving power to something other than God. 1412, why should we not trust in God when he has guided us in our paths? We will steadfastly persevere in the face of persecution, in your persecution, in God the, the truster shall trust. Another lesson, I learned that God has the best surgeons, ones that don't even need to make an incision on you to heal you or anything like that. As long as you, by God's grace, figure out what you're doing wrong, God will heal you. God will take you out of any situation that you're in and he will completely heal you. I've learned that God will make the reason as to why you're getting a consequence perfectly clear. Uh, and honestly, just as importantly, God gives us all the tools to really understand what we're doing wrong and to stop. He gives us the knowledge to be able to stop what we're doing wrong. And yeah, because of fear and because of uh, you know, planning for, for the worst case scenario, uh, I, because of all of my shortcomings, really, I, I wasn't able to actually fully enjoy and immerse myself in the trip uh, or in the adventure. Um, I wasn't able to glorify God every, every situation. You know, when I'm going up the cables, I should have been glorifying God. Like, what an experience. But instead, I was like, you know, breathing pretty heavily and I was just like looking down and I was, I, my only goal was to go up to the top of the mountain. I, and funny thing is, actually, once I got to the top, I realized that I actually need to go back down. So that, <laughs> that caused a lot more anxiety. But thank God, I did like 50 al and uh, I felt a lot better. But yeah, those are just missed opportunities. And, uh, and really, if you look at weaknesses in general, that's all they are. They're just missed opportunities to please and worship God. And uh, I want to read, I want to end on 2215 again, because it's such a powerful verse. Because if we actually implement this in our lives, like there's absolutely nothing that we won't be able to do with God's help. 2215, if anyone thinks that God cannot support him in this life and in the hereafter, let him turn completely to his creator in heaven and sever his dependence on anyone else. He will then see that this plan eliminates anything that bothers him. Akim Salat, let us pray. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim Maliki Yawm Din. Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. Ihdinas siratal mustaqim. Siratal ladina an'amta 'alayhim ghayril maghdubi 'alayhim walad dalin. Allahu Akbar. Subhana Rabbil Ladim. Subhana Rabbil Ladim. Subhana Rabbil Ladim. Samia Allahu liman hamda. Allahu Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. 
Allah 